Radio Television's I Team. You may recall the first I Team project focused on malfeasance in the Minneapolis Housing Inspections Department. That series of reports brought about a public outcry for reforms in that department and for similar investigations of other government agencies. But uh, tonight we offer a rather different sort of I Team report. It's a detailed examination of a world of corruption and violence that thrives in the Twin Cities. We speak of organized professional bookmakers. Over the last decade, bookies have been the target of eight major gambling investigations. The conclusion is always the same. Bookies handle a staggering amount of money, but there's much, much more to the story. And with that story tonight, here's I-Team reporter Larry Schmidt. Larry? Doug, many people believe that sports gambling is a harmless pastime, certainly no threat to their own safety or well-being. The purpose of this I-Team investigation is to examine the accuracy of those beliefs. Minnesotans are crazy for sports. When the Vikings aren't playing football, we get worked up over North Stars hockey, kick soccer, our own kids' little league teams, or whatever game happens to be on television. Minnesotans are crazy, too, for sports gambling. Somehow the contest is more exciting when there's action, a little money riding on the final outcome. Fact is, Minnesotans bet so much money on sporting events that bookmaking in the Twin Cities is a more than $100 million a year business. That's enough money to run St. Paul City government for a year, enough to rival the gross annual sales of big companies like Apache Corporation and Munsingware. Dollar for dollar, gambling is as big in Minnesota as any place you can name. The trouble is that in this state, most gambling is illegal. Professional bookmakers run the risk of violating state and federal laws, and sports fans who gamble commit a crime every time they contact their bookie to place a bet. You know, frankly, a lot of people get turned off when you start talking about the dangers of sports gambling. They figure it's basically a victimless crime, a harmless form of recreation that, after all, is legal in many other parts of the country. But the law enforcement officials, the police and FBI agents who enforce the gambling statutes take a different point of view. They figure that a lot of the money that bettors lose goes to finance other more serious forms of crime, like drug traffic and extortion. But the huge volume of cash tends to attract the mob element. That means more violence and the possibility of public corruption. For the past several months, the WCCO I-Team has been piecing together a portrait of sports betting and bookmaking here in Minnesota. We've plowed through court records and transcripts from across the country. For nearly two months, the I-Team followed bookies and their associates to learn more about how they operate. And we were able to obtain a court order releasing these tape recordings from an FBI telephone wiretap investigation of Twin Cities bookmakers. The tap was in place at the peak of betting just before the NFL playoffs and the college bowl games in January of 1977. Now, some of these tapes have never been heard outside the courtroom. Most have never been played anywhere in public, like this Sunday morning conversation between a gambler and his bookie. Hello? 62. What do you need 62? Uh, Ted. Well, I'm gonna find you first. Okay, you want Pitt minus five, yeah? 600. Minus five for seven. Oh, hold on. Pitt minus five for 600. Go yeah. ahead. Vikes. Vikes minus five and a half. Six and a half. Six fifty. Mm -hmm. Over on Pitt. Over. I mean not Pitt, excuse me, on Vikings. Over thirty-two Vikings. Four and a half. Four fifty? Yeah. Go ahead. Gotcha. Okay, but you got Pitt five for six. Vikes five and a half for six and a half. Over thirty-two Vikes for four and a half. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Yeah. Experienced bookmakers assume that their telephones are tapped, so they talk in code, generally accepting bets only from trusted clients who identify themselves by number rather than by name. We just heard better number 62 place bets totaling $1,700. The Steelers to win by more than five, the Vikings to win by more than five and a half. Most bookmakers extend credit and settle up weekly, paying winners and collecting from losers what they wagered and lost, plus a 10% commission. Now, the goal of the bookmaker is to try to get by on this commission or juice rather than have to worry about which team is going to win or lose a game. So as the bets come in, the bookmakers try to trade bets back and forth to minimize their risks. In gambling jargon, they're laying off to one another, trying to guarantee that they'll make money whether their customers do or not. In this next conversation, taped by the FBI, bookmaker Dwight Mezzo is trying to dump some unwanted action onto another obviously reluctant bookmaker. Remember as you hear this that in gambling language a dime 
means $1,000, a nickel is 500. Okay, six and 33, right, here's what I want. I want uh, uh, LA plus six for a dime, and I want under 33 for a dime. Okay? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, I can't stop all that. Wait a minute, you want? LA plus six for a dime and under 33 for a dime. Rams plus six for a dime. Mm -hmm. And what else? Under 33 for a game. Talk to you later. How am I supposed to get rid of this shit? What do I know? I can bet you every day for the last three years. No, no, I don't need a dime <laughs> on these games. Well, that's what I always bet. You know I always bet that. But I can't dump it. I was going to bet you. Well, you've already bet me on the Vikings for a thousand. Yeah, I know, but give me the Vikings back then. Give me the Vikings no. back. No. It's only money, Joe. What's the difference? I'll talk to you later. I got, it's only money. You got plenty. If I had yours, I could throw mine away. It was telephone conversations like that one, overheard by police and the FBI, that preceded this year's big gambling raid in the Twin Cities, Sunday, January 11th, just as the NFL championship football game was starting on TV. The raids were a surprise to the I-team. We did not know they were coming or that phones were being tapped. But as it turned out, lawmen seized evidence of bookmaking at the homes of several people the I-Team had been following since early December. Jack Capra of Brooklyn Center, Robert Sherson of St. Paul, and Buddy Wolk of Northeast Minneapolis. But the focal point of our surveillance was here along Washington Avenue, just a block from the University of Minnesota's Memorial Stadium at Caruso's Campus Pizza. We parked a van on the fifth floor of this ramp overlooking the rear entrance of this combination pizza parlor, game room, and bar. And then we just sat here day after day for several weeks watching the traffic down below. Campus Pizza is one of the bookmakers' favorite restaurants. One of the first things we noticed was that the regulars here adopted a uniform of sorts, light tan windbreakers with blue or brown across the shoulders. George Patterson, in the leather jacket, a convicted bookmaker, sold several to Jack Capra in the blue sweater. Jack works at the pizza parlor, but openly admits he gambles for a living. Capra has been convicted six times in the past nine years on gambling charges. He is now appealing a two-year sentence and a $5,000 fine for running a high-stakes floating blackjack game. Fred Police got one of the jackets. Police is Capra's cousin and holds part of the campus pizza's liquor license. The other licensee is Capra's sister. In 1976, police was indicted by a federal grand jury on bookmaking charges, but the case was thrown out when a judge ruled the wiretap was technically illegal. Some more of the jackets ended up with Aurelio Nardi, a St. Paul attorney who frequently defends bookmakers and who says he's been betting and associating with bookmakers for more than 20 years. Nick Petrangelo showed up wearing another jacket. Nick is part owner of the Pilots Club Bar on the West Bank. The Pilots Club was busted last year when police discovered gambling devices were being sold from the bar. Roland Fuller is also a regular. Police searched Fuller's apartment last November for gambling paraphernalia. Investigators found evidence of bookmaking and some illegal Valium and hashish. Fuller was charged with two counts of drug possession. He's pleaded not guilty. Like Fuller, the bookmakers and gamblers who gather at Campus Pizza are not strangers to more serious forms of crime. Bookies previously convicted of heavier crimes have switched to bookmaking because the penalties are lighter on gambling charges. And the bookmakers we observed here tend to associate with people who commit more serious crimes. For example, Anthony Runt Petrangelo is a longtime associate of Jack Capra's. Petrangelo is a convicted burglar who turned to gambling only to be nailed twice by federal authorities and sentenced to prison for three years in 1975 and two and a half years in 1978. John Fregali and Victor Molinaro, partners in a couple of used furniture stores, appeared to be campus pizza regulars until they became preoccupied with legal troubles. Fregali, the heavy-set man with a mustache, pled guilty two weeks ago to food stamp fraud, buying food stamps for 50 cents on the dollar and accepting the stamps as payment for home appliances. Molinaro, in the light blue jacket, pled guilty in the same scheme. He was also convicted last month on state charges of fencing stolen goods. Robert Bubba Adams, police record includes burglary and grand larceny. He was picked up for fencing stolen goods, but was not convicted. He runs Bubba's B&B Closeout store on West Broadway in Minneapolis. Last year, he was charged with promoting and profiting from prostitution at two saunas he owned, but the case was dropped when the main witnesses disappeared. William Buddy Wolk has been partners with Jack Capra in illegal gambling activities and is ranked among the most prominent bookies in town. 
He has a burglary conviction on his record and did jail time for interstate transportation of stolen securities. Narcotics agents have long suspected that Wolk is a major drug dealer in the Twin Cities. When investigators searched Wolk's home during last month's gambling raid, they discovered more than one ounce of nearly pure cocaine. They also found sensitive scales, bagging supplies, and drug cutting material. The I-Team has learned that federal prosecutors soon will seek to indict Wolk for possession with intent to distribute cocaine. That's a partial cast of characters for our I-Team series. We'll tell you much more about some of these individuals as the week goes along. In summary, we've found that at least some of the more prominent bookmakers are convicted burglars and thieves who found gambling an easier or safer or simply more profitable form of crime. Bookies who stick to gambling alone associate and do business with those who have defrauded, stolen, and fenced. And a considerable number of bookies and their friends like to eat pizza together. The rest of the week will show you that bookies can get violent, that they do have mafia connections, and try to get close to police and public officials for the purposes of self-protection. Tomorrow night's topic is murder. Larry, tonight we saw a number of the alleged bookies, but uh, uh, how many uh, big time or, or major bookies are there in this area, would you guess? Well, it's hard to give an exact figure. The authorities estimate there's somewhere between 80 and 150 bookmakers operating in the Twin Cities at any given time. That is mostly in the, the really heavy betting season around football time. Uh, the, the season may start with 150. A lot of them don't make it because it's a kind of crime where you need a big bankroll and so only the really prominent ones, the ones that have the cash, are the ones that, that get through what the season. What can they turn over in an average weekend? Oh, a quarter of a million dollars sometimes. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Larry. Good report. In other news tonight, police and Asian into organized Georgia. sports gambling in the Twin Cities. And I-Team reporter Larry Schmidt last night identified a cast of characters who will appear in the five-part series, and some of whom we'll meet again tonight. Larry? Doug, last night we showed that even if you never place a bet or would never dream of calling a bookie, sports gambling has an impact on your life because a significant number of bookmakers and their friends are into drugs, theft, burglaries, fencing, stolen goods, and such. And we all pay a Christ price for crime. Tonight we talk about bookmakers, threats, violence, and murder. The University of Minnesota, academic home to 55,000 young men and women bustling community dedicated to higher education and the advancement of society. Down Washington Avenue, closer to Memorial Stadium and Williams Arena, the shops and restaurants students frequent in their leisure time. That's where you find Caruso's Campus Pizza, a rather average looking place, not for a moment appearing to be a hangout of bookmakers and gamblers, fences and convicted burglars. But weekdays, from midday to mid-afternoon, that's what it is. It is also the main setting for our story. Not out front on the avenue, but in the parking lot out back, where the WCCOI team watched the comings and goings for more than a month. This is where Jack Capra comes to work, and Capra has been busted for sports bookmaking about as often as anybody in the Twin Cities, usually with evidence that on any big weekend, he handled bets totaling hundreds of thousands of dollars. Sports bookmaking in Minnesota is a more than $100 million a year business. That's a lot of bets won and lost, a lot of payoffs and collections between bookmakers and their customers. Some of those transactions are not very friendly. In fact, these tape recordings from an FBI investigation of Twin Cities bookmakers show just how nasty a bookie can be trying to collect a bad debt. The bookmaker doing most of the talking here is identified in the FBI logs as a man named Arky. I talked to a guy yesterday, and I said, look, I'm called him, and I said, come to first year, I want some money. I said, well, I've carried you long enough. I said, well, I want some money. So I've got problems with you. You've got problems. You're going to have problems. Bookmakers claim that very few threats of violence actually lead to physical harm, but our I-Team investigation turned up evidence of two situations where not just head knocking, but murder was discussed, and both involved Jack Capra. This is Aurelio Nardi, an attorney from St. Paul who has defended Capra, and at one time or another, most other Twin Cities bookmakers as well. He readily admits to placing bets with his bookie clientele, even while acknowledging that such wagering is clearly illegal. 
lawyers as officers of the court are sworn to uphold the law. Nardi is unorthodox in other ways too. In these pictures, he appears to be purchasing articles of clothing from the trunk of a car. When we asked Nardi what he was doing here, he said that he knows Edward Scheiman, to whom this Cadillac is registered, but he refused to answer any other questions about the transaction. One of Nardi's friends and frequent companions is Robert Bubba Adams, whom he describes as one of the greatest guys in the world. Adams has been convicted of burglary and grand larceny and was charged in 1980 with promoting and profiting from prostitution at two saunas he owned but the case was dropped when the main witnesses disappeared. In 1979, Minneapolis police cited Nardi for participating in a disorderly house, a sauna on East Lake Street. He claims he was caught taking a statement from a client. We mention these factors as background because in October of 1975, Aurelio Nardi was overheard in a court authorized wiretap in almost daily contact with a bookmaking ring once advising Jack Capra about the license plates of FBI automobiles used to keep the bookies under surveillance, and on another occasion, instructing Capra on a method of hitting an FBI agent, then making it look like an accident. In underworld jargon, hit means murder. The apparent target was FBI Special Agent Dog Salberg, who was in charge of the Bureau's local organized crime and gambling investigations, and who has played a significant role in sending Jack Capra and several other Twin Cities bookmakers to prison. Nardi admits he was angry with Solberg and once accused Solberg of lying in court, but he denies instructing Capra on a method of hitting a federal lawman. Nardi would not appear on camera, but this is part of what he told us in his office. No, 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 that is not true. That is not true. Nardi would not appear on camera, but this is part of what he told us in his office. Jack Capra refused to discuss this subject or any other on camera, but in a telephone interview he denied ever having been party to such a conversation. The only real proof of what was said is in the wiretap itself, but a judge ruled the wiretap illegal on a technicality, so the tapes are not available. However, we found the information on public file in U.S. District Court. The other connection between Jack Kepper and the subject of murder developed a year and a half ago in the fall of 1979, when gangland figure Rocky Lupino hatched a plot to gain control of all bookmaking in the Twin Cities. Lupino's scheme was to kill one or two local bookies as an example to anyone who might refuse to cooperate with his move to take over. Lupino's first target was Jack Capra, and the plan was to unfold here at the Campus Pizza. Rocky had been paroled only months before after spending 25 years in prison, doing most of that time for the kidnapped disappearance of underworld character Tony DeVito. Now Lupino enlisted the help of admitted jewel thief Melvin Englert and a third man to carry out the contract on Capra. Englert was to enter Campus Pizza from Washington Avenue, grab Jack and take him out the back door where Rocky would be waiting in Capra's own car, intending to whisk him off to the third man's farm. At the farm, Lupino's plan was to extort all of Capra's money by threat, your money or your life. He would torture Capra if necessary to find every last nickel the bookmaker had stashed away. And then, when he had literally bled him dry, Lupino's plan was to kill Capra anyway. But the kidnap extortion murder plot failed. Minutes before the kidnap was to take place, a policeman called and tipped Capra to the plot. So when Mel Englert came through the front door of Campus Pizza to grab Jack, the bookmaker had already fled out the back. As one source put it, Capra came within six seconds of getting it. As a result of this scheme, Rocky Lupino was arrested in January 1980 on probable cause conspiracy to commit murder, but the county attorney refused to take the murder case. A search of Lupino's car at the time of his arrest had turned up some parlay cards, so instead of murder, Rocky ended up being charged with gambling. He skipped bail on the gambling charge and now is jailed near Chicago, charged with the murder of an Indiana jewelry salesman. Rocky Lupino has long been rumored to have syndicate ties, but then he spent so much time in prison it may not make much difference. Tomorrow we'll tell you how some Twin Cities bookies have done business with mafia-controlled gambling enterprises in other states. Doug? Well, Larry, what? Obligation of organized sports betting in the Twin Cities. Well, last night, I-Team reporter Larry Schmidt showed us that bookmaking is not a pretty business. Sometimes it can get pretty violent. And tonight, the subject, Twin City bookies and the mob. Larry? Doug, last night we explained how a gangland figure Rocky Lupino in 1979 failed in his bid to take over all bookmaking in the Twin Cities by violence and intimidation. 
So now as before, a sort of free enterprise atmosphere prevails in which anyone who wants to take the risk can become a bookie without paying tribute to some kind of overlord. There may not be a resident La Cosa Nostra family in Minnesota, but professional gamblers here do conduct business with mafia-controlled bookies in other parts of the country. This is the city of Boston, known for its marathons, its politics, and its unique place in American history. This is Larry Zanino, known as Boston's second most powerful mafia leader and a favorite of Raymond Patriarca, the reputed godfather of organized crime in New England. Zanino, here being arrested in August 1980 for his alleged role in a $300 million a year mob-controlled sports bookmaking ring. This is Abraham Sarkis, known as a convicted bookie and prominent Boston gambling figure for 20 years. Sarkis arrested last summer in the same dragnet as mobster Larry Zanino. Swifty. Sarkis has such a long-standing reputation for involvement with illegal gambling that for years he was banned from all race tracks in Massachusetts, including this dog track that belongs to his own son. The names Sarkis and Zanino are important in understanding the nature of sports gambling and bookmaking in Minnesota. The reason is simple. Some Twin Cities bookmakers have been doing business with mob-connected gamblers in Massachusetts going back at least 10 years. And here's one more important name, Alvaro George Lanzetta. In 1971, Lanzetta was indicted as part of an interstate bookmaking ring along with 15 Minnesotans, including William Buddy Wolk, Jack Capra, and Anthony Runt Petrangelo. Lanzetta from Springfield, Massachusetts, was overheard in an FBI wiretap calling Jack Capra to get the pro line. In gambling jargon, the line is handicap information bookies must have to do business. In a two-week period, Lanzetta called the Wolk Capra operation 41 times to discuss the odds and point spreads on sporting events. During the 1975 baseball season, when William Big Bill McCahill of Minneapolis was indicted on gambling charges with Jack Capra and 10 others, the FBI said McCahill got his line information from Boston, then shared the numbers with other Twin Cities bookmakers. And during the 1975 football season, a sweeping investigation by the Justice Department's organized crime strike force in Boston led to charges that Boston Mafia figure Larry Zanino bankrolled and Abraham Sarkis shared in the profits of a huge sports betting operation that extended from Boston to the Twin Cities, where convicted St. Paul bookmaker Roger Clarence Larson was implicated as the Minnesota connection. It turns out this person who was betting me um, was a bookmaker who was betting me during the off-season, during the hockey season, because I was making up a hockey line, and uh, they had a hockey line out east that uh, they felt was uh, definitely better than some dumb Swede could make up in Minnesota. So he was calling me, well, then uh, from payphones and betting me, and then it got around to football season, and he kept calling me, and he got careless because he was booking, and he started calling me from his office. His office was wiretapped. Larson was convicted under the Organized Crime Control Act. His sentence was as harsh as any received by the ringleaders in Boston. Larson, a former elementary school teacher, now claims to be out of bookmaking altogether. But what about being mob-connected? Someone was betting me from out of state that I did not know, and um, someone here was settling the account. I didn't know the person, never did, till later on, after I was <laughs> charged with being one of his... Uh, partners virtually. I didn't know his name. To better understand Larson's involvement, it's helpful to know first that the headquarters of New England Mafia Chief Raymond Patriarca is not Boston, but Providence, Rhode Island. Second, that a man named Louis Ritaco, listed in government files as a notorious hoodlum, formerly of Providence, was living in the same northeast Minneapolis house as Twin Cities bookmaker Buddy Wolk. And third, that when Roger Larson was picked up on the FBI wiretap, he was taking his calls from Boston on Buddy Wilkes telephone. We have established that you were, you were intercepted on his phone in the case, right? Um, part of the time I was intercepted, I may have been on his phone. I believe that's right. We, at the time of that happened, Louis Rotaco from Providence, Rhode Island, was living in the same house with him. And Providence is the home of the Boston Mafia. Well, but other than uh, suspicions, do we have anything here more than gambling? Well, do we have anything more generally when you say that there aren't any connections than just a lot of what you call bunk? 
our own national connections. Maybe some people have some connections. For the record, here's one more connection. The date, February 1977, roughly the same time Roger Larson, Mafia leader Larry Zanino, and the mobster's reputed gambling associate Abe Sarkis were indicted in the same FBI probe. The place? A Ramada Inn at Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where law enforcement authorities found Abe Sarkis in the same motel at the same time with five Twin Cities bookmakers, Jack Capra, Bill McCahill, Robert Sherson, Vern Cleave, and George Patterson. Police believe the gathering was no mere coincidence and assume the bookies met and talked. What they may have discussed is not known, but for lawmen, the fact they were together is important in itself. It seems safe to assume that at least some money bet and lost in the Twin Cities ends up with the Mafia, helping to organize, rather just to finance, organized crime. And tomorrow we turn our attention to uh, how the bookmakers relate to the local police. Larry, some people would ask, why should we care if organized crime is involved in Twin Cities gambling? Well, I think that uh, probably the best testimony on that is from a man named Vinnie Teresa, who was a mobster himself and turned government evidence. And he said, uh, he wrote a book about it and talked to government investigators and said really that gambling... Is of WCCO Television's I-Team investigation of organized sports betting in the Twin Cities. Last night, I-Team reporter Larry Schmidt showed us a number of connections between Twin Cities bookmakers and gambling rings controlled by the New England Mafia. Tonight we explore a different concern. Larry? Doug, tonight we deal with the issue of possible police misconduct as we return to our stakeout of Caruso's Campus Pizza on Washington Avenue with a stop first in Brooklyn Center. This is the home where Jack Capra lives on Russell Avenue North in Brooklyn Center. Capra, one of the Twin Cities' more prominent bookmakers, does not own the house. In fact, with Internal Revenue Service liens of roughly $140,000 outstanding against him, the government could seize property like a home or a car held in his name. Bookmakers like Capra are required to pay a 2% excise tax on the total dollar amount of bets they handle. Since the state penalty for a bookmaking conviction is light, most often a fine of $1,000 or less, police often supply the IRS with evidence from their gambling investigations as an indirect method of crimping a bookie's lifestyle. This is one example of how lawmen sometimes go the extra mile to combat illegal gambling enterprises. But there are differences of opinion among police as to whether gambling is a serious crime. And it's reasonable to assume bookies would try to exploit these feelings. This FBI wiretap recording shows how one Twin Cities bookie made a point of hanging around with the cops to find out what the police were up to. I talked to, I talked to a kid, uh, remember, I don't know if you know the guy named Willie. You know, he's a guy uh, from hanging around Halleck's. He was telling me that some people downtown give these kids, these people who went out and arrested everybody, give them some heat. He says they were like a, a vigilante committee. And I guess they stopped it. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I understand. This is what he told me. He says that they, they, they gained some heat from downtown, these people. Yeah, he says he didn't, he, pers he says he, he hangs around, he hangs around with a lot of cops, Minneapolis PD, because on his, during his softball team, man. Huh? And he says that they, they're stopping it. They're stopping it? Yeah, that's what he says. Yeah. Listen to what he has to say, you know what I mean? Because I know he knows these people, you know, some of these Minneapolis uh, police. Bookies, it seems, like to rub elbows with friendly cops. Well, during the I-Team's two-month stakeout at Caruso's Campus Pizza, where Jack Capra works, we saw a lot of one policeman in particular. One such day was December 30th, when several people who had been convicted of, or were at that moment under investigation for bookmaking, showed up at lunchtime. Paul Dean, the bearded man seen here with Jack Capra, who was overheard just two days before in a police wiretap, telling Capra the status of betting on various teams, saying, we won big. Anthony Runt Petrangelo, twice convicted and jailed on federal gambling charges. George Patterson, a convicted bookmaker from Eden Prairie. Mary Lulu Wolk, wife of convicted bookmaker Buddy Wolk, overheard on the same wiretap telling Capra, Buddy wants four dimes on Arkansas and two dimes on Mississippi, wagers totaling $6,000. Robert Sherson, convicted a few months before of running a floating blackjack game with Jack Capra, appealing a one-year prison sentence in that case while being overheard on a police telephone tap placing a bet with Capra for $16,000. And finally, there was this man, who we later discovered was Minneapolis policeman Jack Bauer, visiting Campus Pizza during his time off, staying inside more than two hours, emerging in conversation with Capra. Bauer is a 13-year police veteran who served two stints on the vice squad. 
enforcing the gambling laws. Now Bauer is on general assignment in the second precinct where Campus Pizza is located. We next saw Officer Bauer three days later, January 2nd, arriving in uniform. He appeared to be on duty, accompanied by Officer Michael Dale, on January 5th, staying an hour and 20 minutes. Also January 12th, the day after local police and FBI agents raided the homes of Capra, Wolk, Sherson, and others, Bauer, Dale, and a third policeman were back again. The next day, Bauer was back alone, staying for an hour and 25 minutes. His car this time parked across the street from the pizza parlor on Washington Avenue. So in the month after we first spotted Jack Bauer, he had appeared at Campus Pizza nine times in and out of uniform. The Minneapolis Police Department manual says that officers should avoid regular associations with persons whom they know or should know are persons under criminal investigation or who have a reputation in the community or the department for present involvement in criminal behavior. Based on the I-Team's observations, the Internal Affairs Unit of the Minneapolis Police Department is already investigating Officer Bauer's behavior. Officer Bauer refused to be interviewed on camera, but over the telephone he said the only reason he goes to Campus Pizza is to eat, and that one of the owners, Jack Capra's cousin, Fred Pleece, is the only person he ever talks to there. As for gambling, Bauer says, I don't look at it very seriously. He says he feels more strongly about crimes such as rape and burglary. It's worth noting, then, that Jack Bauer is a good friend of Curtis Anderson, who we've also seen at Campus Pizza, and who has been suspected as a source of cocaine in the Twin Cities since at least 1978. Anderson holds the license for a Hennepin Avenue strip joint known as the Roaring Twenties. Just two weeks ago, federal narcotics agents raided Kurt Anderson's home in Robbinsdale searching for cocaine. In his garage, they found a 1979 Lincoln Continental. The car was registered to Minneapolis police officer Jack Bauer. Bauer told us he keeps his car, his Lincoln Continental, off the street in the wintertime and that this is the third year in a row he's parked his car in Kurt Anderson's garage. Bauer says he was amazed to learn Anderson might be involved with cocaine, that he won't believe it until his friend is indicted, and that even then he'll help Anderson any way he can. The policeman adding, only, I'm not going to be compromised by anyone. To date, Anderson has not been charged. Thus far in our series, we've examined the violent world of, the sometimes violent world of organized sports betting in the Twin Cities. We've shown its ties to the mob and how it may have led to misconduct of uh, at least one Minneapolis police officer. But tomorrow night, we will offer the startling conclusion of our investigation, showing... 600 cars, 80 model examples, like this fully equipped Mustang, just 54.88, or like this loaded Fairmont, 49.88, or like this gas-saving Fiesta, only 44.88. Immediate delivery plus long-term financing. Get a check for $610 to $1,157 on Ford's new 10% cash assistant program. Shop in 60-degree comfort during the Great American Indoor Sale at Jerry Palmer Southdale Ford on 494 between France 100 and Bloomington. WCCO Television, Minneapolis, St. Paul. From WCCO Television, the Northwest's leading news station, this is the 10 p.m. Report. Good evening. There is still no verdict in the Ming San Shu trial. One of the Hopkins City wells has been shut down after hazardous chemicals were found in the water. In sports tonight, the Kicks indoor soccer season came to an end out at the Met in overtime. The hockey gophers tangled with their arch rivals, the UMD Bulldogs at Williams Arena. And later tonight, we'll offer a report on the successful test firing of the Space Shuttle Columbia's engines. But this evening, we leave this newscast with the fifth and final part of our I-Team investigation into organized sports betting in the Twin Cities. And we note uh, right up front at the outset here that this is not the custom. It's not our custom to lead this broadcast with series reports. But we have to consider one fact, a fact which was hammered home time and time again as we prepared this series. And we quote the President's Commission on Law Enforcement, 1967. All available data indicates that organized crime flourishes only where it has corrupted local officials. Doug? Well, last night's report showed one level of possible corruption here, the cozy relationship between Minneapolis police officer Jack Bauer and the group of bookies and gamblers who hang out at the campus pizza. A, rel a relationship which uh, lends the appearance, if not the fact, of protection of their activities. But does the possible corruption go beyond one officer in the police department? Here's Larry Schmidt with the answer. Larry? The Doug One prominent name does appear at several turns in our investigation, that of Minneapolis City Council Majority Leader Walter Dietzig. 
This was the first hint of a Dietzik connection. The police and FBI raid last month on the home of Minneapolis bookie Jack Capra. Among the items seized was a letter from Alderman Walt Dietzik. The letter was actually addressed to a private investigator named Vince Carraher. It referred to a meeting between Carraher and Dietzik last summer. At that meeting, Carraher, working for Jack Capra, asked Dietzik for information about two undercover officers assigned to investigate organized crime in Hennepin County. Dietzik told private investigator Carraher that one of those officers, Jim Dukowski, was living in sin with a policewoman. Dietzik said he'd find out where they were living. When we asked the alderman about the matter, Dietzik claimed he didn't know who Carraher was working for or how the information would be used. Yet in a signed statement to the I-team, the private investigator, Carraher, insists he not only told Dietzik at the outset that he was working for Capra, but also how the information would be used. Quote, I told him that Jack Capra had complained that these guys were harassing him and that he wanted me to just check out some of the rumors about Dukowski's character. I told him that if this information turned out to be true, that it could be used in court to discredit or impeach the investigator and investigation. Unquote, the statement of private investigator Carraher. In other words, Alderman Walt Dietzik, himself a police officer on leave of absence, gave damaging information about fellow policemen to a private investigator who turned the information over to a known felon, Jack Capra, to be used against those officers and undermine any case they might bring against Capra. Private investigator Carraher says Dietzik knew all along the information was going to Capra. Dietzik denies that. Alderman Dietzik admits he has it in for the two organized crime detectives because he thinks they've been harassing the owners of a bar called the Pilots Club. Those owners, named Petrangelo, are friends of Dietzik. They helped him in his election campaign, and he helped them get a liquor license. One of the Petrangelos, Nick, is a frequent backdoor visitor at the campus pizza where bookie Jack Capra works. So is Nick's father, Anthony, who was convicted with Capra in a bookmaking ring. Last year, when the two organized crime investigators arrested a bartender at the Petrangelo's bar on a gambling charge, Alderman Dietzik went to both Police Chief Boza and to Sheriff Omot, asking them to rein in the investigators without much luck. He brought up certain things which I think are perhaps uh, uh, of a personal nature involving uh, Detective uh, Dikowski, but they have nothing to do with his investigative uh, methods or techniques or his uh, loyalty or integrity as far as being a law enforcement officer is concerned. Dietzig might have been uh, angry over it or whatever, but as I recall it, it was, it, it, there was not, no, no problem that I could see. I simply told the officers to go on investigating and, and, go by and take it where it ever led. It was after this twin failure that Alderman Dietzig met with private investigator Carraher and gave him the information about the detectives' private lives. They zing me, Dietzig told us, and I zing them. But that isn't the end of the story. Dietzik knows another one of the major characters in the campus pizza clique, convicted burglar Bubba Adams, and allegedly came to his aid as well about five years ago. In 1975, a Minneapolis police officer arrested a woman working at one of the saunas owned by Adams. The woman was charged with prostitution and gave a statement that Adams profited from her acts of sex. Shortly after that, the officer, John Hennessy, says he was stopped by Walt Dietzik, then a police inspector under the Hofstede administration. Inspector Dietzik pulled up alongside my car, honked his horn, and motioned for me to pull around the corner, which I did, and I pulled up alongside of uh, uh, Baldwin Chevrolet, and uh, he got out of the car, and uh, we had conversation. What did that conversation entail? Uh, basically, he stated that uh, the people on the moral squad were using me to embarrass the mayor, that uh, Bubba Adams was a friend of ours and uh, uh, had been good to us, and uh, we were being uh, used to discredit the mayor. What did you infer from what Inspector Dietzig had told you? That uh, Bubba Adams was uh, to be left alone. He was not to be arrested. That uh, he was a personal friend of his and the mayor's. Former Mayor Hofstede says, although he knows Bubba Adams, he would not call him a friend, and Hofstede says he had no knowledge of any attempt by Dietzik to protect Adams. One missing voice in this story, obviously, is that of Alderman Dietzik himself. Although he spoke to us by phone last week upon our initial inquiries about his letter found in Jack Capper's house, 
he would not consent to an on-camera interview, saying, I don't want to be part of your gambling series. And when the statements from Policeman Hennessy and Private Eye Carraher came rolling in, Dietzik simply disappeared. He avoided our attempts to reach him by phone, dozens of attempts over a period of days. And finally, when we visited his office, we found it empty. His aide, Tom Bordwell, said Dietzik was taking a couple of days off, denying at first that his absence had anything to do with our allegations. But then... He doesn't care to respond to any allegations or anything right now. He doesn't know of any allegations, and that's it. That's it. Finally, Bordwell said that Alderman Dietzik had gone fishing. Besides the examples we've just outlined, the I-Team has learned of several other alleged attempts by Alderman Dietzik to interfere with criminal investigations. All this week, we've been showing you a hidden element in our community, sports gambling, that tends to diminish the quality of life for each one of us. There's a lot of money in bookmaking. It appears some of that cash goes into narcotics traffic. So if you don't like drugs on the street or in the schoolyard, then you ought to be upset about sports betting. Some gamblers and their buddies are into burglary and fencing stolen property. If you don't like people breaking into your home, then you ought to be upset about sports betting. Some Twin Cities bookies are connected to the Mafia. If you don't like mob influence in your town, then you ought to be upset about sports betting. And we've also talked about corruption, people abusing their positions of trust and authority, a policeman hanging around with criminals, a city councilman undermining a criminal investigation. If you don't like corruption, then you ought to be upset with sports betting. We hope these reports have shed some light on the largely hidden world of the bookmaker. We don't think any citizen would knowingly support the drug traffic, burglaries, mob influence, or corruption associated with bookmaking. We don't think you would, knowingly. And now...